So welcome everyone to today's talk. So the, the, the title of today's talk is Digital Transformations, Effects on Agricultural Products and Methods to Assess Market Trends. It is the fourth talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential application of agricultural products. We hope this series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker today, Professor Francisco Cisternes. He is an assistant professor of marketing at the Chinese University of Hong Kong Business School. He received his PhD and Master of Science in Business Administration from Carnegie Mellon University in the United States and a bachelor degree in industrial engineering and a master of science degree in operation management from the University of Chile. He's originally from Chile. His research interest focus on modeling customers' interactions with firms and exploring the relationship between the digital and physical channels using big data and combining aspects of operation into marketing. His research applies to fintech, sports and retail industries and environmentally friendly food consumption. His work was awarded two research grants from the PNC Center of Finance Services and Innovations and was distinguished with the Dipanka and Sumana Chakravarti Fellowship for his contributions to research in marketing. He is also working on the CUHK, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and University of Exeter in UK, John Center for Environment, Sustainability, and Resilience Grant. In the following presentation, he is going to introduce digital transformation effects on agricultural products as well as methods to assess market trends and discuss the challenges and opportunities to producers in the markets affected by technological advances. Now, please welcome Francisco to the floor. Francisco. Okay, your turn. <laughs> Thank you for, for the very nice introduction. Share my screen. Uh, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor Amin Lam, for inviting me to this talk. It's, a, it's an honor to present in this series. Um, I will start, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I will talk about different, different, uh, digital transformations on effects on agricultural products. Uh, but first, I think you already said everything, who I am. Um, I think the main key point is that uh, I'm coming from Chile. Uh, which is also an undeveloped country, but we're fighting to become more developed uh, in the recent years. Um, it's also an agricultural country. Uh, we have a lot of exports and I can enjoy some of the, of the food here in Hong Kong, uh, especially the fruits. Um, and I think because of my background, most people uh, will question of why do you want to do more uh, research or explore more the the agricultural field. And I think I have to thank that to, to my colleagues in the social science uh, department that they introduced me to this topic. And the more I learn, I find it more fascinating. And I think it's very important. And I'm very happy to have small contributions in this field as well. So let me start by mentioning something that perhaps most of you already know. We need more food uh, because the population is growing. Um, luckily, the pandemic is going to be under control, um, so we will have increase in population, uh, and many predictions put the number of, of people by to, to 10 to 50 in around 9.7 billion people. And that means that we need food to feed all this population, and some estimates put the number that we need to increase the food production by about 70%. So how we can make this? 20% seems to be a large number. 
So let me go with a little bit of history. Um, and actually, some of these predictions uh, that were discussed since very old times. And the most famous one is uh, Thomas Malthus, uh, an economist in, in the UK in 1978 and 1788. He wrote an essay that cited uh, often uh, later on um, about population growth and our ability to feed this population. Um, I wanted to, to quote uh, a literal uh, note from this essay, but at that time, people were very poetic in the way that they write essays. So it's very, very long. Uh, I just chose to, to write a, a very short, succinct idea of what he wanted to say. He mentioned that our ability to, to grow population grows uh, exponentially with the number of people, which means that the more we are, the faster we reproduce. And this eventually will outpace the agricultural production, causing famine, war, and the result will be poverty and depopulation. Very pessimistic predictions. And actually, he went further and he stated that we'll reach this, this limit by in 50 years. Remember, he mentioned this in 1798. So, luckily, this never happened. Um, but his, his assumptions are. Make, make some sense, uh, and then people later on keep quoting him, citing, oh, in the next 20 years, in the next 50 years, this will happen. And it was very recurrent, um, leaving us with a, a trend. Uh, the, the Malthusians uh, group, where they keep saying, even today, that, okay, the population is growing very fast, like what I showed you before, we must feed ourselves. But I think the view right now is that if we survive for the last uh, decade, the, the last uh, century, we probably can survive now. So um, let's take a look at other more history. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go so far behind. I think if I do, the results will be more dramatic. But what I can say is that in the 1900s, 95% of the population live in farms or rural areas um, and engage in food production. Today, only 15% of the people live in rural areas. And among them, not everybody spend their time growing food. Only 2% is engaged in this process. So now we have more people living, more people to feed, and a small percentage of the population in charge of producing food. Uh, we also move from having 20% people with malnourishment to less than 10% today. Uh, and this is way less in, in more developed countries. So now we have more people, few people working on food production, and we have more food than ever before. How we can achieve these goals? Um, also, not only we have more food, uh, we also make it cheaper. Before we have to spend about 50 to 60% of our income to, to feed ourselves. And today is 10% or, or less. So. Well, this number, of course, uh, has a huge variance uh, across different, different countries, uh, but it's a big decrease of what we used to, to have before. So now we have more people, less area to grow crops, and we have fewer people doing that. But the result is that we have more food than ever before, less people hungry, and less people working on it. So how we can achieve that? I think we deserve a very, a very high grade in this respect because we solved these issues. And how we made it possible, in the last, over the last uh, 100 years, uh, especially a uh, little after the 1900, uh, we depended mostly on animal power to produce the food. That means that we need more than 25 million of horses and mules to help us grow food and they in turn need also 39 million of acres uh, devoted to produce food to just feed the animals that will help us to produce food for ourselves. So it was a lot less efficient and we replaced all of that with mechanical tools. By 1925, we already uh, replaced most of the power by mechanical power. That's a big point. So this transformed the landscape. Um, next, we start well, I think we start trying hybrids and, and mixing crops uh, actually for the last 
10,000 years. But in the recent years, we become more efficient in doing that. Less of a trial and error and more about doing this purposely. So we did increase the, the yield of the crops. Um, and this effect was even more impactful than replacing the, the labor, the power from animals to help us to grow crops. And on top of that, we also become much better in uh, creating new and cheaper fertilizers and pesticides. And these also have a compound effect, some multiplicative effects. Now we have more fertility in our crops, so more yield, and we are better at protecting the, the plants. So these two effects combined boost the yields even more than the hybrids and new crops, and even much more than the mechanization. So that's why we can, we're able to produce actually more food that we can eat these days. And all these become accelerated. And this is a footnote um, for Professor Lam that actually one of the earliest um, GMOs that was produced uh, in the US was a company from Monsanto, which is one of the largest corporations for food in the United States. Uh, they create the Roundup Ready soybeans in 1996. So not so long time ago, uh, but the, the scale, how resilient we create the crops, how much yield we can get from every acre has multiplied exponentially as well. So we have done a very good job with these tools in the past, but we reached a point that maybe this is not enough. So I think it's very hard to visualize how much better we become to growing crop from, from just 100 years ago, um, 150 years ago, before we were able to produce 100 bushels of corn, um, and that required 83 labors of hours. Uh, multiple people had to work in a field to produce this, and we need to use 2.5 acres of land. Today, we just need two hours of, of uh, people working on this and about half of acre to produce the same yield. So those effects are multiplicative. Um, before we can harvest 350 acres of corn per day, um, and now we can produce that uh, for, for 1,400 bushels per hour, um, we can unload 3.8 bushels per second. So if, if you made the calculation, this, this means that when we work for eight hours with one person uh, working on one combine, it can harvest enough crops to produce a million one pound loads of bread. That's much better we have become these days. Um, and this is not just saving costs. The benefits are also for the consumers. Um, and as a marketing person, this is very important. Uh, we now have more choices. Uh, it's very convenient. Now we can have food, um, just go to the supermarket and get everything we need for the month. Uh, we can have food that's safer to eat. Uh, we have uh, more security. We have availability of the food of most types uh, all year round. Uh, we have higher nutrition value for each crop. And this is just an, a few examples of the food. So we have become much better uh, in, the, in growing crops and we have been using this technology so far. But today, what we did in the past is not enough. And we started using new technologies to improve the efficiency of our yields, uh, increasing our markets and profitability of our farmers. And this is what I want to talk today. So what have been doing uh, in these areas? Um, a few examples is uh, the digital economies. So now uh, a producer, a farmer, does not produce for the local neighborhood. Now we have access to much extended markets, uh, not just within the town, not just within the city, no, just within the country. We can now produce for the entire world. And this has been enabled just by access to new technologies. The digital market also increased um, transparency of the market, and that's take away a lot of the inefficiencies we had before. Um, in the past, we have people specialized in food production with very little access to, to foreign markets. So they, they didn't know exactly, for, for example, how much 
uh, production was in neighboring uh, fields. Uh, therefore, they couldn't establish, uh, have a good idea what was the supply. They also didn't have a good idea what was the demand for the crops. So it's very, very hard for them to, to generate an idea of what is going to be a good price for this. And they had to rely on intermediaries, multiple intermediaries that took a lot of the efficiency away and actually most of the benefit from the, from the farmers. So now we have data enabled agriculture uh, using these new technologies. Uh, this is a new trend where we can have a lot of information from the crops. We have information about the weather, information about the markets, what is going to be trending in the next few years. And this treated as a business uh, helped me to uh, plan uh, my crops, plan my investments, increase efficiency. And all this in turn uh, turned out to be profits and increased yields for of food for the whole world. Um, another uh, new technology that's been uh, applied in the agricultural industry is the Internet of Things. Um, probably some of you have heard of this in different contexts, but in, um, I'm, I'm very surprised to see that this is widely used in, in agriculture, uh, where we, we have drones we have uh, sensors in the ground. We know the composition of the soil. If there is a change, we have, of course, uh, we can put trackers on the crops itself. Uh, it depends on the, on the chemicals they use to communicate with the environment. We can keep track of the health of the crops. Um, so we can learn a lot of just the crops by itself, the soil. We can learn a lot about. Um, not just the markets and the, and the international trade, but also about the crops themselves. Um, this push forward a high precision farming and agrotechnology. And I was very surprised to know that most of the big food producers, for example, one of the largest producers of food in terms of uh, amount of money of export, the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a very small territory, hundreds of times smaller than the US, which is the largest. Uh, but and, and one other country that is pushing forward to increase the agriculture production is Singapore. Singapore, of course, is just a city, and actually it sounds counterintuitive that they really want to enhance the food production. They just produce about 6% of the food they consume nowadays. They want to reach up to 30%. And of course, they don't have much land. So they need to enhance the technology to improve the crops. They use, uh, artificial light to grow the crops. They, they grow the crops in special rooms with optimal conditions for the growth. And this is all possible because of what we have learned in the last few years about growing crops, the best uh, type of crops, and they invest in a lot of money in, in this area. Unfortunately, this is not the same for every country. And I will spend a little bit of time talking about the inequalities of, of this progress because this has not been equal. So good stories happen in developed countries where they already have enough food uh, or at least ability to purchase food from other countries. And this is not the same for developing countries. Uh, a lot of work uh, has been done uh, in the sense of increasing uh, and promoting greater inclusion in, uh, and collaboration with other economies. Um, for many reasons, I'm not going to discuss all of them in detail here, that integration is more difficult uh, for developing countries. Um, we have to raise efficiency uh, and complement it with other actors in the supply chain. Um, we need to foster innovation and reduce transaction costs. So, for many reasons, uh, I will discuss some of them here. Producing food in developing countries is a lot harder than in developing countries. Not just because um, it's not about the land, it's not about the people, it's about things like infrastructure, not having enough roads or ports to transport the food is a big issue. Um, telecommunications, um, is one of the things that's been improving in the last decade in developing countries. Now, th thanks to the, to the smartphones, uh, telecommunication has been improved 
and that helped a lot of the farmers by communicating directly with the markets, uh, communicating with each other to derive new te technologies and techniques to improve the, the yields of the, of the food, but there's a lot of that has to be done here. Uh, we need to cut a lot of the uh, sometimes frictions posed by the infrastructure from the policy to, to make the same production that other countries. Um, in contrast, uh, developed countries, they just focus on efficiency. They just focus on how can I make more about the crops without worrying much about the infrastructure, without worrying much about investments. Because these are uh, much more controlled, less uncertainty, it's easy for them to plan, it's easy for them to get investors to support them to generate uh, more profitable crops. And of course, they have access to high technology to increase this, uh, the, their crops, become more competitive in the market. So how are the digital markets in developing countries? So I want to stress that this is something that has, is very important and is much more important for developing countries. So we need to improve the transparency of the markets. And I will show you some evidence it's going to be the, it's the real price on the market can increase investment opportunities can help the farmers to adjust um, to to the market conditions uh, appropriately and reduce the inefficiencies in the market um, there are several papers discussing the digital advertisement as a tool for in developing markets because now they realize they have the opportunity to explore to new markets that they didn't have before New markets can get to know what they do and actually compete in a more plain uh, marketplace. Also, these new technologies enhance integration, integration in, with partners, integration with the consumers. So knowing what you want, when they want it, uh, also integrate with the partners, the partners that transport the food. It's not enough to just produce the food if I don't, I'm not able to get the food to where it's going to be consumed. We, we can also enhance the productivity. And these are things that most developed countries always solve. And these are the things that the digital markets and the digital technologies can help a lot with the communication tools. And of course, reduce the reduction of uncertainty. So if we improve the transparency, um, mainly in developing countries, we have uh, found some studies that they have very poor integration as compared to richer countries. Um, also, they have higher cost for search, to search for, for the customers, to search for uh, advances in technology, and this lower competition can create an efficient allocation of the goods. But they're forced to sell at a suboptimal price, having less profits, and this becomes a, a vicious cycle where uh, they become less efficient and therefore less ability to, do, to increase the, the investment and so on and so forth. Um, the volatile food prices, and this is not all because of the, of the food production, of the food cycle or things like weather, um, has a very negative consequences on the welfare of the poor, especially. The poor is the one that cannot access to technology and they have little access to investment. So if an we in increase the uncertainty in the prices, they don't know how much to invest. And even when they do, they might be making sub-investment or over-investment because they don't have the right information. And that's where the technology, information technology can come to help. Um, and as I mentioned before, the supply chain has to be optimized. Uh, in developing countries, in developing economies, unfortunately, we have many uh, often exploitative intermediaries. Some of them impose by government, some of them uh, just uh, create, they try to provide, provide services for the, the, the people, the farmers with low access to information. And this, some studies have, have shown that if we just increase information flow, this reduction in efficiency, uh, this reduction in, in search costs will in turn translate into highly increased uh, efficient gain for their, for their better access to information, 
greatly increased uh, efficiencies in the food production. Um, this is a, a map of the world where you can see where a uh, digital agriculture market shared in the 2019. So as expected, uh, North America and Asia have a big share of food production and market share in the, in the digital agriculture. And most of the food is actually not produced there. But those are great consumers, but not necessarily great producers. And most of the food that is produced in Africa and in South America uh, does not share the same quality, although the production is very high as compared to other markets. Um, I just want to show a quick um, fix of some of the, of the problems that we just discussed before. This is data from India in, in Kerala, uh, where they just introduced, uh, increased the usage of mobile phones. So, although I think mobile phones are available for, for most people nowadays, um, there are some regions where they don't have the infrastructure, the, the telecommunication towers that can give access to people to, uh, to use the cell phone. And when they introduce the cell phone in this area, you can see how the volatility of the market got reduced. So the prices were all over the place. And after people were able to just use the phone to talk to the final consumers or talk to some, even some intermediaries, that greatly reduced the price variation. And this, I cannot express enough how much this can increase efficiency for the farmers, because this effect is multiplicative at the end. And if you know with more precision what is going to be your price of the product, this allows you to plan much better what is going to be the, uh, the investment that you need to do in order to satisfy this in, the, in a more efficient way. So market transparency, um, if we can create more transparent markets, we can increase the arbitrage opportunity for the farmers. Uh, we can reduce um, the spatial and price dispersion and lower wastage uh, in both consumer and, and producer welfare. And there are several studies that support this. Um, so the first one is the one that I took the picture for, but uh, uh, this is an example of, of few literature that relate to this aspect. We can also improve the bargaining power. Having more information can help the producer, the farmers, to increase the bargaining power with intermediaries and with the consumers at the end. So knowing what is going to be the market participation, what is going to be the, the supply uh, this year, can help us to improve this, uh, the bargaining power of the producers. And this is something that has been studied before and how this greatly also increased the, the profitability and actually end up lowering the price for the consumers and increasing the yield for the producers. So it really, it really is a win-win for most uh, actors in the, in the supply chain. Um, and there are other context-specific factors that varies uh, across marketing. Uh, sometimes institutional and constraints uh, can blunt the benefits. So, um, for example, uh, some in some places, uh, access to mobile phone is constrained, uh, not just by policy, sometimes by infrastructure. And when we fix this problem, we can have more transparency in the market. Um, and there are many cases, especially in developing economies. To enhance productivity, um, we can facilitate the adoption of improved inputs, uh, like weather uh, or advices from other, other producers. Um, we can also lower the cost and enhance investment decisions uh, by using these technologies. And improvements in, in rural household food security, income, value, access to enhanced management practices uh, that can yield from just improving the communication of, of producers. So 
when we enhance the, the information technologies and communication tools at the production level, this can greatly increase the, the efficiency of the paper. This is just one example of how we can increase the efficiency. So when we want to compute, the, what is the cost of obtaining agricultural information in 2015 by using different methods of uh, acquiring the information? When, when, um, and this was uh, uh, a, a research conducted in, in, oh God, in one, in an African country, uh, they start using landlines, so not even smartphones. And this really increased the efficiency in the market because before they need to, to resort to mass media, uh, radio, personal visits. Actually, that was the most common uh, according to this paper. That they need to go to the marketplace, they need to visit the, the customers, they need to visit the producer. And of course, getting information that way was a lot more expensive than using landlines. And this greatly increased the, the consumer and the producer welfare. Um, so when we implement these uh, technologies, it's not just allowing the technology to be in place, but in order to have a successful uh, implementation of digital technologies, uh, some people have researched and found that um, we need the help of local institutions like the politi uh, political government. Um, we need also human capital. We need to increase uh, digital literacy um, to teach people how to use this technology. And also when we have a huge income inequality, this also hinders the spread of these uh, digital technologies. So when we tackle these areas, is where we can have the greater effect in making the implementation of these new technologies faster. Um, in order to, these technologies also enable us to increase efficiency in the logistics. So I mentioned a little bit about the supply management, but when we increase the coordination across all the players in the supply management, everyone in the supply chain gets better. So when I tell, if I'm a farmer, a producer, if I tell them exactly or more accurate how much food I would produce, they can better plan how many trucks they need to hire or how many investment they need to acquire in order to satisfy this demand. And this can produce saving that would be transferred to the consumer in cheaper routes and also maybe higher prices for the producer and not just the consumer. So everybody benefits by uh, more information across the supply chain. Um, increase the capacity utilization if we have storage facilities. Uh, so, and this happened across the whole, the entire uh, supply chain management. Also, we enhance the food safety. Uh, we can implement uh, and in some, in some countries, this is required, the tracing of the food point to point from the, exactly where it was produced until the, the consumption of the products. So this greatly increased the food safety because now all producers will be responsible for producing healthy crops. Um, and this efficiency uh, that look a little bit uh, that the producers may not want to follow, actually, they are one of the main beneficiaries of this, um, these policies because it, it forces them to be more efficient in the production. Um, and a new technology that uh, is being utilized better for developing economies is uh, the secure payment. So this is also another need that has been uh, enabled by the increased uh, improvement in technology um, because now we can pay using uh, digital currencies uh, and sometimes foreign currencies that are not subject to the same uh, conditions and inflations uh, that are probably local currencies. And we have very good examples in Nigeria and Kenya using mobile money to pay for this. 
So this is an example of how the information can flow and how this information can help to increase the next, next step of the, of the supply chain. So when, when we start, we, we now have access to satellite information about the weather forecast, about the, the, the yield of the, of the crops. We can use this to prepare the consolidate this data and plan for what is going to be the, the sowing of the crops. Uh, also, we can transfer this data to different, to the next player in the supply chain, how this can plan for the transportation, for the fertilization, for the plant protection. All sharing information can benefit from this, this uh, transfer of information. So, um, as I mentioned, something that uh, um, is a little bit surprising is that Mo found an internet just by themselves have created this, this new technology have significantly affected all sectors of the economy and especially agriculture. So now we can promote greater inclusion with these broader economies, we raise efficiency, we foster innovation and reduce the transaction costs. So what makes uh, developing countries a little bit different is that overcoming this information problem uh, has been uh, difficult. And now we know that actually uh, it's not just about getting some, uh, getting people to have access to internet. Uh, this really creates income, income inequality. There are some papers that cite access to information or access to technology really create more inequality, create um, lack of income for the, for the, for the country or the people that live under these conditions, um, just increasing the knowledge uh, across the consumers, across the producers, increase efficiency and just by itself improve welfare of the population. So also they can share the, the ideas of how to grow new crops. Um, and this is often underestimated uh, because people in similar regions, similar conditions, similar weather conditions can share how they do better to, produce, to protect the crops, to improve the yield and under those conditions. And this has greatly enhanced by uh, sharing this information across all of them. So there are many examples of promising, examples of positive impacts of rural livelihoods. And everybody can get these digital dividends. So having more, more uh, digital technologies, everybody can benefit. And this is what people call digital dividends. Now we can increase efficiency, efficiency increase, increase the welfare, not for just a group of people, but for everyone. So we all need to push for this. Um, and this is our, one of the main reasons why uh, food production is often more expensive in, in developing countries. They have more barriers to, to, to face. So, to summarize and, and to finish my talk, uh, I just want to mention a few, few points. Um, the benefit of new technologies are more important in developing countries. And the reason is that they depend, they, they, the new technologies actually solve most of the problems that they are facing. Uh, just having a, a good um, cell phone network with good internet access. Only that can generate a uh, surplus for the whole economy, increase the welfare of all the actors in the economy. And this is something not so difficult to do. And they are in disadvantage with the developing countries, but they already overcome these difficulties and they're focusing more on efficiency. They're focusing more on getting the last drop of the new technology in developing this new technology to to get more competitive advantage in the market. But we already start a little bit behind. Um, and if you want to do this faster in your region, in your, in your, in your working place, uh, and this is my takeaway, you have to improve digital literacy. You need to educate uh, people how to use this technology. You have to give them access to it. Uh, you need to improve the telecommunication infrastructure and you have to increase uh, internet availability in those areas. So now some countries uh, 
added access to internet as one of the of the human rights, one of the rights that the country give to the people and they cannot take away because it's that important. Um, other important factors that contribute faster progress in this area are regional integration. Very important to not just collaborate with your neighbors uh, in, in, in the town, in the city. I think regional integration across countries can potentiate uh, key uh, differentiated advantages that you may have as a region and, and also reduce uh, variance because sometimes uh, when, especially in production of food, you're subject to a lot of uncertainty from the weather. So if you have a bad year, uh, you can rely on your neighbors to, to come, out, come out of it. And also uh, you have a much bigger market. So if your market is affected, but uh, you rely on other markets in the region, you can have a more stable condition to create and attract more investment. And also uh, the last takeaway is that we cannot forget about traditional infrastructure, like railroads, um, storage facility, ports, airports, because we need to get the food to the places that is gonna be consumed. So we need to pay attention to these five points and this will great, greatly speed up the process of uh, adoption of new technologies. And this in turn increases the welfare for everybody in this question. So that's it. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Francisco, for sharing the first uh, interesting talk about the powerful internet. I, I guess this is the highway in the cyberspace, right? Compared to the highway that connected people to each other, they are all important. But uh, Francisco put it in the context of reducing the inequality by helping the developing countries and the people there to access better to the market and have a more efficient production system. I think that is a good point to, especially for our friends in South Africa, they are trying to build uh, agricultural business. So before we, um, <clears throat> we start our discussion, could we all take a picture first, right? So, uh, show your face and so that we can capture your photo together with um, everybody. So please um, unmask yourself <laughs> using the powerful internet to show your face. Yeah, I still have somebody who haven't, yeah, okay. I, I saw a lot of people familiar face now. <laughs> oh, actually, our lawyer got the chain. <laughs> yes, so, welcome. So, uh, Dico is here, and uh, Oscar, will you, say, will you show your face? He, oh, yes, now it's not a photo, right? it's a real face. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, everybody, uh, please um, try to show a face so that we can take a picture. Okay, so who's who's taking it? This is the, okay. Go ahead. Okay. So we'll take one more. Okay. Good. So finished with the pictures. Time. So now we can start our discussion. So uh, if you want to say something. Just unmute yourself and, and ask your question, okay? So I, I received one question from Professor Han from China. So let, let me ask for him because his microphone is not working. So dear Francisco, thank you for your nice presentation. In the past winter, many Chinese people enjoyed fresh chili imported <laughs> from Chile. I thought fresh cherry Sorry. imported from Chile <laughs> and it seems that there is a largely highly efficient chain to export fruit to outside world in Chile. Could you please share the experience of Chile to build international market oriented modern agricultural industry in this digital era? Can you share your experience in Chile? Thank you for consuming the, the Chilean product, first of all. Um, I think there are many factors that play a role there. Um, I think Chile 
And same as um, South Africa, we had the advantage of being counter season. So at the time that uh, we experienced summers in Chile, the, most of the world that lives in the Northern Hemisphere are facing winter. So we can produce products that they cannot have access to at that time of the year. So that, over the time, um, create incentives in Chile for dedicating more time and effort to becoming better producers of some crops. Uh, I think Chile is very good at producing fruits that are in high demand in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and because of this effect of the, the counter seasonal production. Um, that's, that's one aspect that play a role, but of course it's not the only one. The second one was uh, institutional uh, help from the government. So we realized that we need to create exports of, of more final consumer goods. Um, and also we know renewable goods. Chile, uh, perhaps you know, but in the past we've been a main producer of non-renewable goods like uh, raw materials like copper. So once you take it out from the ground, it's gone. Uh, so the government took the money that it get from these very profitable businesses and put it into enhancing more renewable products. So that's why maybe in the supermarkets you might see Chilean wine, for example, or salmon, because we think that this is something that we can continue doing over, over the time. And this has been a long-term strategy that the government has been encouraging, uh, subsidized, and, and, and better production. Uh, I think that's very, very important. Um, third point is that in the last, I would say, three years, 35 years, Chile has become a stable currency. So very low levels of inflation for more than 30 years, which is uh, a great achievement for a developing country. And that actually allows people to take debt and make investment to enhance the production of, of, of in particular, the, the these, these new crops and new agricultural crops. That's very important, and this is something that's not available. Uh, I'm more familiar with the countries in South America where they have sometimes the price of the dollar fluctuates a lot, and that makes it very difficult for planning and investment and attracting investment. And this stability also attracts foreign investments to, to generate even further. So this is, uh, has a multiplicative effect. So all of this, of course, and now, from the demand side, of course, when Chile wants to export, have trade agreements to, to, to send food to, to the three biggest markets, uh, the United States, uh, Europe, and, and China. We have free agreement for every country that wants to have free agreement, free trade agreements with us. And all these factors combined has produced um, a boom in the production of these products. So um, I think there are many key things that we can learn from and that we can take away. To, to improve our own production. So yeah, that's, that's my answer. So I, I guess in summary, um, first is the anti-season of production. So yeah. if you learn about the markets, you, you will know when is the best time to produce anti-season products, right? <laughs> so, so in the Southern Hemisphere, you have an advantage that you can right. produce anti-season fruits for Northern Hemisphere. And then you have a government intervention. So they will build all the infrastructures, make all the free trade treaties and keep a stable currency. I think that is an interesting point. Because compared to Argentina, they have a fluctuated currency. Sometimes when you do the planning because of the fluctuation, you may end up losing money by paying with a different cut of uh, money. <laughs> so, so, but I think Chile has um, done a good job in maintaining the, I think you have uh, anchor your kind of currency with some like US dollar or something, right? So I think at, at, at we change the constitution and we separate the central bank from the government. Okay. And the central bank goal is only to keep the value of the Chilean peso stable. Uh, and as you mentioned, some countries like Argentina, they have controlled the, the currency and they control the exchange at a price that uh, is fictitious. It's not what people are willing to trade. And this creates two prices for the currency. Okay, and this is terrible. Yeah, right. Okay, so jo uh, Joanna, 
Dr. Chen, could you ask the question yourself? I think you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I have two questions. The first one is, um, yeah, with this uh, digital transformation and uh, you know all this uh, knowledge uh, to to promote the efficiency for for especially the uh, developing countries, which party do you think should play the the most important role for improving the the infrastructure? Because if without the the right setup, the physical setup, maybe you know even people have the intention to improve, may may not be able to do it. Should the government play an important role in this or in your view? Good questions. So, 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 so Professor, I'd before like you answer more the about question, the, the digital innovation. May, may I take on my, may, may I take on my question? So, so, so I think Joanna want to ask which party. I, I, what are my question is actually linked to that. What would you envision that someday that that the consumer can make direct contact with the farmer so that you would click, 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 and then your, your grocery, your freshly from Chile, your wine, your, your grocery would be developed in kitchen, New York office, right? So when would you envision when that is going to happen? Good, good question. So I'll try to answer the questions in order. Uh, so what, what Joanna asked me uh, relates to what, how the government can facilitate and speed up the process of these innovations. Um, I think um, most, the most important thing is having actually the traditional infrastructure in place. If you want to produce for the world, you need to have a good way to get to the rest of the world with your food, with your crops. That means having good ports, having good uh, roads and railways to help you to connect with other, other markets. Um, and then we can, I think, in the second order, uh, among all the things I mentioned of how we can improve. So I think there are many fancy technology that can help you to keep track of every detail in the in improve the efficiency of how to grow the crops. I think more important than that is communication flow. And that's uh, the infrastructure. The government also can help generating the infrastructure to uh, enable everybody to have access to mobile phones and and internet to communicate. And I think the communication using internet can help at every level of, uh, of the supply chain, can help you customers to communicate with the, directly with the producers, customers uh, and, and the, the producers communicate with the transportation and the storage facility. And this is all possible with the same tool. So I think if there's one tool that we would like to enhance to facilitate the adoption of other technologies, Will be will be telecommunications. So, and, and in order to answer the last question, how can I envision um, that this transformation will happen where consumers can contact directly the producer? Uh, in my experience, this is already happening. Um, unfortunately, not everywhere. So, of course, started first in in developing economies where you can talk directly to the manufacturer, and actually we have. Uh, an explosion of small producers and more customized products a welcome customer can contact directly, help them to produce something uh, customized directly for you. And this is happening in already in some, for some special products. Um, I don't envision this happening for everything because I think there's some key advantages of and key um, economies of scales for some products that uh, are not negligible. So for some commodities, I think we still will rely on the traditional supply chain, but I think more and more people is pushing towards more customized products and more whole customers, uh, whole producers and sellers more accountable for what they sell to me. So I think that now the, the balance of power transferred to the consumers. Now the consumers are very powerful because of the social network before, because of this technology can can actually make one company go bankrupt if consumers uh, agree that this is not a good company. And this is the, the, the double-edged sword, right? So communication can work for good or for bad for a company. So yeah, I think we live in a very, very fascinating world these days. I, think I'm, I'm, I feel very lucky to live in this 
epoch of transformations. We see all these transformations taking place right now. Uh, just to share my... Okay, so I, I, I saw a question from Diko. So Diko, uh, could you ask your question yourself? Uh, uh, thank you, Prof. Lam. Um, Francisco, um, thank you very much for a very good and very uh, in-depth uh, talk. Uh, very eye-opening. Thank you very much. Um, so I was just wondering, I mean, I think my question is also related to uh, Joanna's question as well. Um, um, South Africa is a very good example of a country that needs to adopt your closing words, really, uh, in order to push development, not only in agriculture, but general development in the country. And we invest quite a lot of money in um, research activities, close to 2% of our GDP, uh, which for a developing country in Africa is uh, probably the first or the second in Africa, uh, so South Africa and Tunisia are top there. And yet these um, research investments really um, go to waste in the sense that uh, people like you uh, who are in academic research come up with really concrete answers uh, to some of the challenges that we face, but government um, and even the private sector for that matter really fail to implement this. So I was just wondering if you have any ideas of how you know, these can be uh, effectively communicated and adopted by both government and private sector in a collaborative way that will actually take countries forward rather than, uh, you know, developing solutions that uh, sit in the shelf and nobody really pays attention to them. Thank you. Very good question. I think, um, I can tell you what I've learned from some countries that have made this transition successfully. But I think this is a very deep question that requires perhaps a, a longer discussion. So let me give you a high level answer for that question. Every country I, I, I look into that made this transition had had a strong support from the government. And the private sector can do it sometimes, but it's a lot more difficult because, because if you don't have the, the proper um, traditional infrastructure, uh, so for example, in Chile, I don't know, the, the early mining companies that had to establish and create a product, they had to build their own ports and they had to build their own highway. And they were able to do it because mining is a very profitable sector. And actually the risk is very low. But if you talk about um, food production, the risk and the uncertainty are, are a lot bigger, which discourage investment of this type. So if you want to build a port, you want to plan for the next 10 or 20 years of production. And this is very uncertain because uh, probably you know better than me that weather uh, matters a lot in terms of uh, how it's going to be your yield. There might be some years that you want to have a lot of uh, production in some years that you might, might actually lose some money. So without the proper uh, planning, we, you cannot plan the investment well. So the government can help to facilitate this infrastructure for the production. And actually, this can pay in turn to the government and to the, to the country because we will produce better jobs, more jobs, we will generate more income and taxes where that can be, again, used to, to, to improve this. So I think Government support is something that uh, has a key role in the production. Uh, it's been some cases, I think, you asked me how about the private sector. The private sector can, can persuade the government to, to with, with arguments in terms of production, in terms of, of social welfare, that these are, are changes that need to take place and the countries that have done this uh, have been very successful and there are plenty of examples like this. So actually Chile is one of the examples and there are many others that uh, happen in not necessarily developing countries. So uh, how about, do you have follow-up questions? I guess uh, I, I, Francisco yeah, yeah, tried to I, answer your question, but there's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a follow-up question on yeah. this answer. About the private sector. So Professor, what do you think about tokenizing 
So everybody going to tokenize, right? So I think that any action that you do, you need money, right? And then I think that you can have a national tokenizing program. For example, Chile can issue some sort of producer level of token, and then the US can actually have some sort of exchange in the consumer sector. And then by having it tokenized in a way, we actually get the private sector all motivated. And with all the cloud funding and everything, I do think that I can easily rally for a lot of people who will subscribe to that sort of token, particularly buying Chile Chilean wine, right? When they when we actually now can trading and whatever. So you can actually look at Bitcoin and whatever. And do, I do think that the private sector can participate a lot. And then with the government, the government is not really having a huge budget in budgeting those token, but in terms of regulation of those tokens. So I, I do not know what your perspective in terms of this digitalization. And then it also cross reacting with the producer versus the consumer. I think one quick way to put this is that the government has to create the, the framework and the incentive. And the work is actually done by the private sector. But without this framework first, the private sector do not have incentive to do this investment and these changes. Um, the, and you're right that um, the, the private sector has a lot of uh, burden in, this, in, in doing this transformation. I think it has two double tasks. One is to, to demonstrate that these investments are going to be profitable for the country in the long term. And also to acquire, um, but in order to do that, they need to, for example, as you mentioned, the, the children wine, uh, they create like a, a union, uh, a cooperative, where they, they advertise this in the United States, in China, oh, this is children wine, and advertise with the brand Chile. It's not just one producer. It's one country that is producing. And that's how we are able to, to position this, this brand on, on the international landscape. But this did have some support from the government as well. So I think if, if the private sector is able to convince that this is a good idea for the country, you are able to, to do it. And I think most governments want, all governments want what's best for the country. And if you are able to demonstrate this, they will, they will support. Because actually it's not gonna be expenditure. So and all these things are not cheap, but this is not expenditure, it's investment. Investment in, in, in the future. Yeah, I guess, I guess it partially answered the question from Professor Han on how do the governments change their roles after the agriculture enters into the digital era. So could you elaborate more on this question? Because after everything becomes digitalized, what is the role of governments that they can do? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, the government have been more reactive. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, technology has moved moving faster than the laws. And, and sometimes uh, the bureaucracy that makes this transformation slower than what they can be because, um, but I think this, is, this may be a good thing is that knowledge is moving so fast that it's very hard to keep up with, with this. And governments, the, the speed that they release new laws and make some changes has, uh, has been lacking. So I think one way that the, the government can can be more efficient and speeding up this process that I think is still happening. It's just that not as fast as we want it. Is that they dedicate uh, more people to, to monitor the changes and create more reactive uh, laws. And also, I think in some cases, the government are hesitant to, to make changes because sometimes it's not clear what they should do. So, I think it's better to experiment and try some things. If it doesn't work, keep changing and keep adjusting until you, you get it right. Uh, we need some testing in some cases. So I think my, my strongest suggestion is to, to encourage the government to constantly monitor the changes in the industry because I think the technology advances are, are happening faster and faster. Uh, and yeah. Okay, it's interesting to mention that the technology always runs much faster than the laws, right? <laughs> so I, I, we have a lawyer here, right? So Albert, do you want to comment on this? Is, is Albert, yeah. 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 
I think the law can only give certain regulation for those people who actually cannot follow certain rules. And uh, it's really like deterring us to expanding our, our creative thoughts. And uh, so uh, that, that would be the position of the law. Just in case there's some bad boys over there, so the law would actually hit their hands like, no, you can't do this, right, or whatever. But uh, so, uh, it, uh, I, I think the intervention of creating a very rigid rule and law and whatever is the last resort. I agree. The, the government should intervene only when the market cannot solve the problem by themselves. Um, but unfortunately, this happened with the new technology, right? It creates some, uh, and actually, new technologies have been in discussion a lot recently for the monopolistic behaviors that uh, the concentration on, on industries. Um, and I think it's, 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 a, it's a very hard solution. Uh, it's a very hard topic to, to discuss. I think the European Union has some position, the North America has some position, uh, China has some position, and it's not clear, I think, what should to be doing. But I think I agree with you that uh, the government intervention should only be necessary when the market cannot solve the situation by themselves. Okay, so is there any other audience would like to raise a question? Please unmute yourself if you have any questions to follow up or you can type it into the chat box. Pretty quiet. <laughs> Okay, I guess, may, um, may, may I have the luxury of asking the last question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Professor, I, 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 I was actually cooking whole this night weekend because of the Chinese New Year. And I noticed that in, uh, in the United States, we waste a lot of food, a lot of agricultural stuff. I'm an oversubscriber. So we have a couple of kids coming and play. So I cook the full table with stuff. What do you really envision with the digital world how can we really limit that sort of global waste, right? So I very much that I want to like, oh, I have so much food, I stuff in my, my refrigerator, I give all the parents all my food, but I'm still oversubscriber. So when I really try to throw away my food, I actually have a lot of new complex, in fact, that I even say a prayer, but still, like it is not going to be helpful. What do you really envision the United States as very noxious in that regard that we waste like maybe 20% of the food resources of our agricultural product and and it's really, really bad. And how how do we really have some sort of, and could you envision, you know, some sort of system with the minimum like impact for the, for, the, for the people like me who really like trying to uh, say, digital well, please help me. This actually is a, it's a very good question. And it's been asked before how we can minimize the waste. And uh, the, the way I look at it is twofold, right? For so one, on the one hand, we produce enough food and then we can actually have the luxury to waste. So this is not uh, too bad of a problem for the US. The problem is that at the same time, there are people that need the food and they don't get it. So I think this is a very hard dichotomy. And the problem is not about food production today, it's about getting the food to the people that need it. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Nam, at the beginning of the talk, I have a, um, I study a little bit of operations management. And companies, in, in not necessarily for, for agricultural products, they have been trying to minimize waste because waste is always uh, undesirable. And what they come up with is a solution that and this is also in, in the market when, when you have uncertainty of when you're going to get the products and if you're going to have it on time, people tend to accumulate, right? To have a buffer. So what they come up with is minimize the buffering and, and therefore the waste by just having the food or, or the products that you need at the time that you need. So you order exactly what you need with minimizing the waste. So perhaps, and this is more, uh, an idealistic world that I envision, I don't know if this is going to happen, is that we can reach to the point that I can get the food that I'm going to eat just when I'm hungry and not before and not after. And then I won't over order to prepare in case that it, it was delayed or after. Maybe something like that would be, would be a, a solution. Uh, because I think 
we are solving a lot of the problems that we have before, the production, the availability, the safety. Now we need to improve the logistic to get the food to the people they need it when they need it. So if we, if we diminish the uncertainty, this could be one answer. But I think this is a very good question. I don't, I don't think uh, I know all the answers, but I think this, this is a very good question to think about. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, before we end, I think we need to do some advertisement for the next talk. So could uh, Joanna share the screen of our poster? Okay, so uh, our next talk will be on March 30th. It will be on the insects and other arthropods in agriculture, field survey, biotechnology and genomics. It's more a biology talk by Professor Jerome Hoy from our university. So if you have um, a smartphone, you have internet, obviously, and you can just uh, scan the QR code to register, or we will also email you the registration details later. So um, today is more on the marketing side, and the next talk will be more on the biology. And the talk, a little bit, uh, just uh, tell you a little bit. So the talk in, uh, April is, uh, is also, also different from the April in March. So we have some cultural talk later and then we have some uh, uh, company talk later. So it will be quite diverse. Okay, so please um, stay on our talk series. I, I hope that uh, this talk series will help everyone who are interested in agriculture. And we will videotape each talk and put a link uh, in our website so, so that you can also always revisit what the speakers have said. Okay, so I, I believe that here there are also some speakers here, like Elvis is going to talk about the legal aspects of agricultural data. Okay, so, so with that, uh, end the note. So, happy Lunar New Year and uh, good evening or good morning for, for, for different people right, in the world. Okay, so I will see you. Uh, at, uh, in the end of March again. Okay, bye bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.